cool initiatives is looking for innovative and creative education technology ideas, platforms and products still in the early stages of development that embody the idea of the future of education. We're excited by projects that help our schools function better or those that drive new ways of teaching and learning. All finalists in the competition get at least £500 with the runner-up getting £5,000 and the winner getting £10,000 cash. No strings attached. In our ever-changing world, education matters more now than it ever has. Better technology improves how our schools serve parents and students. The ways in which data is used are evolving. Institutions are embracing new tools and platforms that help motivate students to learn and make teaching more engaging and interesting. Behind the scenes, school offices are in need of digital transformation as learners, parents and teachers have become accustomed to a hyper-connected world. We imagine a world where all learners and teachers can harness their own information, much the same way a Fitbit or an Apple Watch is capturing our health data to enhance or improve our well-being. Technological innovations have the same potential to enhance our education system. Easing teachers' administrative burden, improving how teaching is designed and put, and advancing our understanding of how students acquire knowledge. In short, we want to allow teachers to do what they do best and teach. Whether you're in the early stages of developing your product, a teacher with a great idea or a student with a prototype, the Cool Initiatives team would like you to apply. Please visit www.coolinitiatives.com forward slash competition for more information and application details. And remember, the deadline is February 28th at 5 p.m. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's The EdTech Podcast, the show about improving the dialogue between ed and tech for better innovation and impact. As you might be able to hear, I've got a bit of a cold this week as I hopped on my bike for the first time in a long time this weekend, only to be greeted with some impromptu snow. I hope you're all faring a bit better and keeping warm, unless, of course, you're listening in from Australia, in which case we can only imagine what sun-induced euphoria you are feeling right now. Talking of where you are and what you're up to, thanks to listener Charlie Gideon out of Montreal for his voicemail commenting on episode 94, what is AI and what has it got to do with me and my students? Here's Charlie's thoughts on how AI could help us present our better selves. Hi, this is Charlie speaking all the way from Montreal. I just finished listening to the latest podcast and was really excited to hear all the different uh, evolutions of testing and AI that are being used in schools right now. I currently work in an incubator where we're experimenting with using artificial intelligence to simulate environments for entrepreneurs to develop soft skills like negotiations, uh, setting up meetings and sending communications to investors and other high profile people, whereas usually the entrepreneurs might be nervous and, and testing them might be uh, hard to monitor. Uh, you know, we want to explore how technology can help us uh, solve some of these problems. So if you have any ideas or any research on that matter, uh, we'd love to hear more of it. Cheers. Thanks, Charlie. And if you'd like to leave a voicemail for the show, you can also do that by going to speakpipe.com forward slash the EdTech podcast. This week, we're throwing back to a Women Ed event in November, where we discuss the importance of female digital leadership, both within the education and ed tech sector alike. A recent government report on the school workforce in England showed that the state education sector is 74% female, yet only 65% of head teachers are women. We know that whilst the teaching profession is dominated by women, the senior leadership teams are somewhat underrepresented. On the tech side of things, under 12% of partners at both accelerators and corporate venture firms are women. Only 17% of seed funding rounds go to female-led startups, and this drops to 12% for venture funding rounds. What does this mean for what types of edtech are invested in, how they are designed, and who they are eventually used by? Are we heading for a situation like the advertising world of 10 years ago, where only 3% of creative directors determining advertising were women, even though the chief purchasers and influencers within the household were women? Luckily, there are many initiatives working to make a change, and we focus on just a few in this episode to clarify what they are and who is doing what. Number one, women ed underscore tech. 
the spin-off handle from grassroots movement Women Ed focusing on digital leadership. Number two, EdTech Women UK, the UK and London chapter of the international EdTech Women movement out of South by Southwest EDU and Austin. Number three, Nevertheless, the podcast series focused on resurfacing stories in amazing female leadership in education, innovation and technology in the past and present day. First up, Nicole Ponsford, digital leader of Women Ed and leader of Women Ed Tech, is here to explain what Women Ed underscore tech is all about. Uh, Women Ed Tech, we launched um, under the Women Ed blog um, on the 1st of January when we want to... Um, I suppose specialise a little bit more in digital leadership. Women Ed is for all types of leaders, whereas um, with my background in mind, I was keen to look at something that took in new technologies a little bit further. And we seem to be doing all right. I think we've got about 550 followers in in a few weeks. So um, it seems to be something that people are after and interested in at the moment. The community seems to be sort of running which way we go at the moment, which is, I think, quite a healthy thing. So building on what Women Ed do, looking at how it reached to headship, looking at supporting existing and aspire leaders in education. We're essentially doing the same things, but sometimes the questions that um, the community come up with are slightly more practical as they would be thinking about digital work. So it might be looking at what's happening in Google for education. It might be that we're helping with leadership, like with our Microsoft courses that are on the MEC. Um, it could be that um, someone's contacted me recently. They're just about to take over a directorate um, in STEM. So I, I get people contacting the community either on very personal individualized I suppose needs um, but also celebrating so we had a lot of buzz around that a lot of people were very excited about that um, about the women ed panel that were there um, about how they would approach it how they'd bring things back so on the side I've also launched with Kat Wildman the gender equality charter um, I sort of felt that it, the issues just aren't women in education, but also um, the issues we've got with girls looking at technology and um, taking it a bit further. I mean, I've got a son and I've got twin boys and girls. It's also looking at things like um, technology as a whole and how it is perceived, um, looking at how education, how men are associated with technology, but not with early years. And also looking at things like digital literacy and media stereotypes in the home. So the Gender Equality Charter is there to look at how we can create almost native gender equals. So the children are going through school with um, a lack of bias. Uh, The teachers are promoting their subjects, their ideas, their approaches. So when these gender equals go into business, be it tech, be it design, be it anything, that they're not facing the barriers I think a lot of women and men are today. And I think women ed tech is a a, a crucial part of that jigsaw. Lovely. Thanks, Nicole. Next, let's clarify what EdTech Women UK is all about. At EdTech Women UK is an extension of the Austin movement who I met in March last year and have international chapters. Their mission statement is to bring together women and their supporters to increase the leadership capacity of women in education technology through inclusivity, visibility and impact. After meeting them at South by Southwest EDU 2017, I like what they were doing and opened the UK chapter currently operating under the at EdTech Women UK handle. I'm hoping to use the at EdTech Women UK handle to keep track of what female EdTech entrepreneurs and investors are up to in the UK and to share this back to the international EdTech Women community. It's also an opportunity to share news and support one another and a place to point people to when they say, I just don't know any female EdTech founders of the same quality as male leaders. So get following. EdTech Women is a more industry-focused movement, which is why I thought it would be cool to have a presence and collaborate with Women Ed Tech. Finally, the Nevertheless podcast. Our friends at Story Things have been working on a podcast series that celebrates the women transforming teaching and learning through technology. We highly recommend that you check it out via iTunes to hear from people including Bethany Kobe from Tech Will Save Us, Dr. Sue Black, OBE, computer scientist, social entrepreneur and author of Saving Bletchley Park. And Dame Stephanie Steve Shirley, tech pioneer, businesswoman and philanthropist. 
So there you go. Just a few of the things that are bubbling about and relevant to this week's podcast. And we would love you to share what else is happening. Follow and comment at Podcast EdTech and sign up to our newsletter to hear about the EdTech Podcast Festival, which launches in March and will feature meetups for digital leaders of all varieties. Finally, make sure you check out the Core Initiatives Fund and apply with your idea before the end of Feb to make a direct change. Right, now let's jump into this week's episode. Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, My name is Sophie Bailey and I'm the founder and presenter of the EdTech podcast. And today I'll be moderating our discussion on supporting female leadership in Ed and EdTech, digital dividends for all. Uh, We've got a great mix of panellists from school leaders to edtech innovators and at the end of this session there'll be time for questions Uh, so do make the most of that and we're also going to share some uh, key takeaways and further reading. So let's jump in and just to let you know so we've got um, on the panel today Hannah Wilson the CEO of Oreo School and co-founder of Women Ed so if we all give a wave. Priya Likhani founder and CEO of Century Tech. Kirsty Tonks, Principal Designate of Shyland Technology Primary School and obviously of here today. Um, Mandeep Atwell, UK Education Manager from Microsoft. And finally, Sarah Prophet Ramsey, Academy's Lead from Tutes Education. Yay. <laughs> so, um, so first up, ladies, what's the current leadership situation within Ed and EdTech? Um, just to give a bit of background on the tech side, um, in the UK, under 12% of partners at both accelerators and corporate venture firms are women. And uh, I picked up a really cool leaflet from uh, Dauntless Daughters, which has some great stats on the back about um, you know, the number in engineering and, and so on. So just wondered to what extent women are involved currently on both the education side and then the tech side. So who wants to kick off? I don't know the statistics, but I know if you think about in your schools, who is doing the data analysis, who is doing the timetabling, and who is leading digital or computing, I bet you the resounding answer is probably a man. And if you've got a woman doing it, it's very unusual. That's amazing, I've got people shaking their heads. But in, in most of the schools, you've got a man in that role, and it's making sure that if we have women leading those spaces, that we get them to be championed and sharing what they're doing. Um, because I think we, we need women actually in those role model positions so the girls can see themselves leading these parts of um, the curriculum and part of industry as well. Any other comments from the industry side of things as well? Um, so it's a really interesting one because I, you know, work for Microsoft and um, very recently, in fact, these past two years, we've actually welcomed our very first female CEO at Microsoft, Cindy Rose, and she manages our industry, the entire industry for the UK across the business. And so for us, there's been a massive culture change at Microsoft and you can see that. Um, But if I look at it from an all up perspective, then I don't know if many of you uh, follow Nancy uh, Schenker, who is the the founder of OnSwitch, but she actually identified that within the fourth industrial revolution. So how many of you have heard about the fourth industrial revolution? Okay, one, perfect. Let me explain. Oh, and So let me quickly explain what that means. Um, So government and businesses are calling today the fourth industrial revolution. And what they mean by that is over the past decade, things have changed so rapidly that um, we as businesses aren't keeping up. So um, in my last session, I used Back to the Future 2 as an analogy, and I'm hoping I'm going to get more people who've watched that in this particular (laughs) session. Um, but um, when I watch Back to the Future 2 growing up as a child and showing my age now you know there was so much stuff on there that you thought that was never going to happen right the flying cars or the the wonderful sound systems etc but today it's a reality so whether it's automated vehicles artificial intelligence the internet of things robotics all of that is a thing of today in fact in my world it's a conversation I'm having every single day so that in essence, is the fourth industrial revolution. And um, what Nancy said, that actually women will be able to fit into three categories. She actually mentions four, but we'll talk about three for a second. Um, The first one being um, the strategist. So if I look at Cindy Rose, she exemplifies that particular body. So for her, she's right at the top, impacting and affecting change 
across the industry. The second category would be a strategist. I think I'd put myself and these, this, these panellists in that particular category who are actually helping move that business forwards or helping move businesses forwards as women. Then you've got the third, which I think quite a lot of women, if we can get them there, will fit into that category. And that's the professional educators and the caretakers who are aware <laughs> that in order for them to succeed in today's fourth industrial revolution, they need to be aware and start using technology across the borders and um, that is where I'd say Microsoft absolutely want to put their efforts in because we know there are lots and lots of people in the fourth category which he does mention and that's the ostriches who are people who are just so fearful of technology that they don't think it's accessible to them and so because it's not accessible to them they're not going to use it but if we look at what that means for their future career opportunities they're kind of doing themselves out of a job so essentially as Microsoft what our position is we want to help all our key stakeholders here understand well how can we get them from that fourth category to the third and then the third to the second and the second to the first. I think, I think a lot of this is to do with the confidence yeah. and we were having a debate about it next. And, and for me, it's very much, when it comes to, to technology um, and speaking from my own experience, um, when I drive a car, do I need to know what's underneath the bonnet and how it works? I don't. And that's been my whole philosophy. I mean, I've, 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 my career the last 10 years has been, sometimes I get that broad feeling, you know, that somebody's going to find, find me out, but I don't need to be the geek in the ivory <coughs> tower. What I need to do is challenge that geek in the ivory tower and say, I want to do this, please help me do it. And it's about having the confidence to go and talk to people who do know how to do it um, and say, please, I want to be, able, there's got to be a better way of doing this. And instead of listening and saying, oh, I don't know, you can't do it like that demystifying the mystique that, and, I, and I, this is a generalisation, but your male technicians, sorry Peter, not you, obviously, <laughs> um, but who are there who say, oh no, you can't do that. And for me, I don't accept no as an answer. And it's going, okay, so tell me how to do it. I don't need to know the workings on of a computer. I don't need to know that, to know that actually it's going to help me in my job. And I think that's the big thing for me, is how can we get more women feeling like that and having the people who can help them to do the things that are there, so not somebody who says no. And on that note, I mean, um, so my next question was, why is digital leadership important in schools? I think we've spoken a little bit about that, but um, why should aspiring leaders get involved in digital skills? Mm. And I just, Hannah, do you have any so ideas just, around what initiatives are happening? As well, well, I was just thinking about what you were saying there, Kirsty. And my thing is, we need to think about our why for the technology in our schools. Mm -hmm. And I think it becomes very curriculum-led. It's about yeah. what do we need to teach the children? Who's the person who understands <laughs> coding? To teach the kids how to code, to get a job in coding. When we first started working with Microsoft two and a half years ago, they kind of laughed at some of the practices we have in our schools about paper driven meetings or two hour leadership meetings why are we not doing flip meetings why are we not doing meetings that are virtual I worked in a map where I had to drive an hour and a half for a 45 minute meeting and at two hours home that's three and a half hours of my life for a 45 minute meeting so why are we not looking at the best practice from industry we know that presenteeism gets rewarded in our schools the women are absent because they're looking after the children they need to leave early they don't get promoted because they're not present we need to completely sort of like flip how we look at things and use technology to actually change the culture of our schools. So we've given every member of staff, ops, teachers and leaders, a Chromebook in our school. We are paper free. Everyone brings their device to our meetings. We then do our minutes and actions in the meeting. And that saves us two hours of typing up minutes and sending out documents. And I think we have to look at things like that. That it's not about the curriculum. It's about the culture of the school and how we can actually <laughs> harness technology to save time and energy to get the well-being right and the workload right in our schools. It's Quite funny. I was just I'm just sharing um, uh, an anecdote uh, next door in the previous session. Um, I was involved in the DfE workforce, uh, the working party in terms of workforce reform. What I was doing was saying, "Come on, technology can really help with this." So I recently, you know, we've been asked whether or not um, to be seconded down um, for two days a week to work at DfE, looking at this, and um, obviously 
I'm going to find that difficult, so I don't think it, I'll, I'll be saying it. But A, as I've said, um, my success is not built on just me. Um, why just ask one person to go and do this role when actually my success and what I've been able to do is built by working with people like Jen at the back there and Peter and Harpreet. So why, why does it have to be just one person? And then the other thing is they're expecting to go down two days a week to talk about technology. how technology <laughs> can make a difference to a workforce. And I think there's something not quite right it. here. Yeah. You know, Skype. Um, and I've been doing a lot of that recently and it just, there isn't a need for us all to be in the same room necessarily, it's worked perfectly well. I mean, it's not ideal sometimes, you, you know, face to face, there's nothing quite, quite like it. But, you know, thinking of the environment, you know, and the train fares and, and driving, you know, and sitting in traffic. You know, come on, we should be, we should be reading. So we, we've got a room of uh, educators here and hopefully they're really interested in, you know, how to build their skill sets with digital leadership and that kind of thing. What trainings are available? <laughs> we had uh, Dame Anderson Peacock speak earlier, so what's available out there in terms of CPD okay. in this space? So, so I can, I'll, I'll, I'll go into the CPD. Um, you all remember the loot. And if you want to sell things at home, it's exactly what Hannah and Curtis are saying. You can basically go and find something like that or you know, call people in the yellow pages and try and sell your goods. And the reason you don't do that is because you've got eBay and you've now got Spock, which is this new version of that, right? <laughs> so all, I think it's just really, really important to drive home the simplicity of this point, right? The most democratising product the world has ever seen is this. A farmer in Africa, right, who might even struggle to get clean water, has one of these. It's absolutely amazing. Every single one of your students has one of these or has access to one of these, someone's saying no, essentially, right? But the majority of the world, the majority of the UK, will have access to these. Mm -hmm. And actually, the majority of the UK does have access to some form of technology where they can communicate with each other. And so, in schools, if we have, and it's mostly women in schools, and we have stats on that, if we have head teachers, senior leaders and teachers not utilising technology or at least giving off the impression that you are afraid to use technology. And all we're talking about is a type of eBay product. We're talking about something which actually makes your life a lot easier. Then what happens is that that then filters down the school. How do you get the training? How do you become digitally liter literate, as they say? Well, actually, a lot of people are already searching on Google, I imagine, when you want to find something. A lot of you are shopping on Amazon, right? Most systems out there that you can use to create meetings, to log into Skype, to, you know, have a virtual learning environment for your children so that they can go in and actually learn, you know, consume content, it's often quite intuitive, right? Tech companies aren't trying to produce products out there that, that you find very, very difficult to use. So sometimes it's just the ability just to get on, log on and have a go. But what you should be doing as leaders, as female leaders, men as well, it's not about excluding them, is demanding of technology companies that are providing you with this particular software and hard hardware to give you the training in your school. What they should not be doing is coming in and overselling a product and then leaving you to it. Between 2009-2012, we wasted £1.4 billion on technology in the UK alone. And so we're complaining about budgets, and we're complaining about the fact that most of you, I mean, let's face it, you didn't come into teaching for the money, right? Are underpaid, your colleagues are underpaid, and you're under-resourced. £1.4 billion. What could that do to the education sector? So when you're purchasing, you need to demand training. Now, there is CPD and training out there, so there are CPD courses that you can find online on how to use particular products, but actually you'll find that most technology companies will attach some form of training to their product. And if they don't, don't damn well buy them. Mm -hmm. Go to them and say, how the hell are you going to convince my staff and my teachers that this benefits me? Don't tell me about your features. Don't show me a demo of your product. What does this do for me? My two biggest issues are workload, right, for example, and actually getting in front of the kids and getting the kids engaged. So the thing is, although we can list CPD courses, I mean, you can find them on there, the, 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 you know, you can find them on pairs and all sorts of places, 
demand off companies that they do that because all companies should be doing right now is providing a parallel customer service. Can I add to that about like the hardware software? I think so many schools invest in hardware and I've gone into schools where you open a cupboard and there's a hundred micro bits and no one knows how to use them and there's like thousands of pounds spent on that hardware. Well, I've, I haven't let anyone buy any hardware until they can tell me the impact why are we buying it? How are you going to use it? How is it going to impact people outcome? I think the software is the way to go. So things like CPOMs, I've spent a couple of hundred pounds on CPOMs and all of our safeguarding paper has gone. It's all online. That's saving my team a lot of time and energy. So I'm trying to find solutions that we can use to save time and energy. And that's how it should be driven, shouldn't it? It should be solution using driven. technology. It should be absolutely about yeah. solutions. Um, for the issues that you have mm. and, and your school's issues will be different to your mm. school's issues to your school mm. and it's about finding the right solutions mm. for you absolutely and what I had a moment I was in Tanzania teaching not this summer last summer for two months and WhatsApp was a really interesting one for me so going back to the phones in Africa there's a massive digital revolution there's loads of investment at the moment on women leading um, in technology um, and I was working in schools with no paper chalkboards <coughs> like no resources but every member of staff had a phone and they used WhatsApp for their school's comms. And I found that fascinating, that I see WhatsApp as me staying in contact with my friends and my family, not a work tool. And I've set up a school, we've got a small team, lots of part-time, and having staff briefing, staff comms, is really challenging when you've got a part-time staff team. We use WhatsApp. We've got a staff team group on WhatsApp, and I do daily messages via WhatsApp. I wouldn't have used WhatsApp for a school professional zone had I not gone to Africa and seen them using it in Tanzania. So I think we have to think about, it's not about learning new things, it's about utilising what we know how to use and actually using it in a different way to bring value. Using them well. Using them well. that's the other thing, is sometimes, especially in a school like this, where, we, where there's a lot of technology, I do sometimes question whether we use all of it. Yeah, as well as you, Sometimes actually just having fewer things and doing it and doing it really well and getting the most yeah. out of it. Yeah. yeah. And, the and, and what you want to see in terms of using the technology is obviously what you're interested in is the impact, right? So you want to actually be able to look at the data, right? It's not death by data. Is this having an impact? Are students logging in and learning? There's already a bit of impact there because if you're struggling to engage those particular students, then yes, that could be a really, really positive sort of quality <laughs> feedback that you can you know take from the students. And you can write up if you want to or type up or whatever you want to do with it. But the point is technology companies gather all of this data. They can give you instant reports on impact. You don't actually need to do anything. So what kind of impact is it having? I just want to also clarify the point. I'm not saying that in a school, sorry, that you should be like, essentially like, giving students mobile phones or them having mobile phones and using mobile phones. I was just making the point about the fact that technology is omnipresent <coughs> everywhere. Now, the other thing, the other point to make about digital leaders and how we can be digital leaders is that these students are on their phones and there's this constant debate, a constant argument about that kids are so good at technology. No, they are not. Okay? That is not the kind of technology that we're talking about. School kids are fantastic at texting, they're fantastic at using Snapchat and great at using Facebook if they're on it. Usually not because there aren't uncles and mums and dads on it. But they can do things like that and they can take photographs. When we're talking about technology, we're talking about upskilling our students so that they can go and get the jobs of the future. Okay? There are 17% of the entire tech industry in the UK is women. 17, one, seven. And that's not founders, that's women in tech. So it is pre, pre, a on, on dire that note, stat. So from a product development point of view, um, the, the money that tends to go into ed tech, the, you know, the actual leadership of most ed tech companies after that point, is, is usually, and the accelerators, etc., the, the sort of ecosystem around it, male-led. Do you think that has an impact on what products are, are developed and then the uptake they may or may not have within, if we're trying to get more girls into sort of digital skills in schools? Is, is that yeah. a fair point? So yes, funding accelerators, etc., are usually run by men. Yes, they don't invest in females as much as they invest in men. That's stats, that's data that's out there. So yes, less females get funding when they have an idea and they want to create an amazing tech company. But actually, I mean, people talk about that a lot and I do know that the stats are out there. I've been on several stages and we've all talked about it. That's not how you're going to fix the problem. I hate politicians who come out with what's going to get them the next vote. Let's change our gen the next generation. The way you're going to do that is the fact that girls do not study the STEM-based subject at A-level. They do that not then go to university or higher education or take apprenticeships in areas that are focused on STEM subjects. And that is the problem. If we continue doing that, there are obviously, it makes logic, right? There are less women who are then having the skills to then go and get those jobs. 
there are less women who then feel that they can create an education technology company or a technology company because they don't have the skills. So I'm incredibly unusual in the entire sector, but everyone in the sector knows this because I actually don't have a tech background and I run an artificial intelligence company. <laughs> and that is really, really unusual. So we need to solve the problem at the beginning. And actually, it's the people in this room that can solve that problem because you're at the front line and you're in front of these kids all day long. Maria, I think it's even wider than that. So for me, it's, it's um, so you're talking about you know getting more... Um, students, female students, into that space in terms of developing pro products. I just think we should be getting all students just to be able to use and harness technology for their learning, you know, and, and, and not just it being a social media sort of thing that they're using. Do, are, we, are we preparing, and this actually goes across genders, are we preparing our young people for the world of tomorrow to go into the workplace, whether it's specifically, uh, uh, you know, in terms of STEM, um, sort of job. I'm just talking about any job because our work, the, you know, the, the fourth <laughs> uh, revolution that is coming, which is, you well, know, which is what the government are preparing for. Yeah. We're not just talking about, you know, the way that our technology is is absolutely transforming some areas and job areas. So we need well, to prepare young people. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to jump in because um, because of time. And because I think it's really important to focus on the potential solutions, and we're not going to come up with an amazing solution today that's going to, um, you know, uh, turn over everything. But I know that of all the people on the panel, there's different initiatives going on. So I, if we can move on to what some of those initiatives are and how people can get involved, and then we can go into our takeaways and also invite some questions because there may be maybe questions forthcoming as well. I haven't got, it's not a main initiative but I, this is how I see it. Make a list of the challenges you face in your school and then go and find tech solutions to them. And I'll give you an example. So if you're not following Claire Erasmus on Twitter, please follow her. She's the Director of Mental Health and Wellbeing at the Magna Carta School. She's doing absolutely seminal work on young people's mental health and wellbeing. They had a problem at their school about young people's mental health and wellbeing and she wanted to harness social media to fulfil the answer to that problem. So the children worked with an app company to create an app about mental health and well-being. Content by children, for children, but facilitated by an ed tech company. All she did was tweet out, we want to build an app, and a company gave their service for free. And, I, I, and one of our things is, if you don't ask, you don't get. Okay, I ask a lot, I get a lot. Okay, I've got loads of free stuff in my school because I leverage our space. So really think about, so like, we, Michael, we literally tweeted out two and a half years ago, we want to host a free event for women leaders. And Michael has said, we'll host you, we'll give you a free venue, we'll feed you, we'll give you technology. And that was an amazingly generous offer from someone on Twitter. So really think about, actually, going out and asking. I met Rocket Fund on Wednesday. Rocket Fund is amazing. Rocket Fund is a platform where you can list on it, we want to buy 10 iPads for our year 10 to do a photography project. It then goes to a crowdfunding platform and people donate money and you get free technology for your school. Absolutely amazing. So for me, that's, a, that's an amazing platform for us all to use. And um, can you talk a little bit about the partnership between Women and Microsoft as well and what you're doing on the sort of ed tech and digital skills side as well? Yeah, so um, in regards to the partnership between uh, Women Ed and Microsoft is CPD. So for us, it's absolutely important. And this is where Vivian actually, who isn't here today, I believe, um, was really, really keen in terms of making sure that the, if we are going to have this partnership, we're taking women on a journey with us, right from um, them just using technology to then also becoming digital leaders at their own schools. So the Women Ed Partnership is Microsoft saying, hey, we have a load of training materials and we can support you jump on, go through the journey and tell us what you need. So it's not a partnership that is set in stone and that's very, very important for you all to know. It's a partnership that will evolve as this particular organisation evolves. The needs and wants of this particular team will change and so will the partnership. So at the moment, it takes you through a digital transformation journey where the end point is that you become digital leaders at your own school. What that looks like next year is entirely up to you because at the moment, we don't have digital leaders out there. We have a few digital leaders. We're hoping through this partnership that will become the majority. And so that is essentially what the partnership's all about. And then Sarah, within Chutes, I understand okay. that it's quite you know, creating a culture of empowering some female leadership within, yes. within the organisation as well. So we've got, um, we're, we're uh, dominated by women on our management committee, which is great, and it's women-led. But also, echoing what Hannah was saying about getting um, technology to solve 
problems in your school and looking at the problem first. And I think that's something that TUTE does. I mean, it's one of the reasons why um, sort of synergy with Women Ed and we're going to support Women Ed is because we are offering um, flexible staffing solutions in your school. So if you have um, women who are going out to do their masters and they're not going to be in school the whole time or they're coming back from maternity, things like that, we will give you that point four of a teacher we will give you that extra staffing for interventions that can be flexible for you. But equally on the other side of that, being a family friendly company, we're also a very flexible employer. So we've, we've got teachers who can choose to work and do online teaching for us, which fits around them in their, um, uh, in their, in their daily life and supporting their families until they might want to go back full time into the classroom. Yeah, I think that I love the um, the timetabling comment earlier, Hannah, and uh, how yeah. much applause that got yeah. was quite yeah. impressive. Well, yeah, we know it's an issue. Yeah. I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking out uh, about something like we could all do together. Is that um, UK EdChat hosted a virtual conference back mm-hmm. in October? Mm-hmm. Actually, do you mean the fact that we've all driven miles to get here today? It's time and energy on a Saturday. Perhaps something Women Ed and Microsoft could do with Ed, with EdTech uh, podcast support is we could actually have a conference that we don't have to leave our lounge. We could be on our couch with our laptop in our pajamas or with a glass of gin. We could have a virtual conference where we have different things going on on a virtual platform, mm. and, you, and you save those two or three hours of driving and energy. And that, and that to me is like a real solution to the CBD on Saturdays type mentality. This is something. Like, this is something that you want to offer multi academy trust because we've got a lot of multi academy trusts that are spread around mm. geographically. So why do you need for a CPD or a meeting to have physical. to travel with all those extra costs and unnecessary time? Um, I, I was speaking to a Matt in Norfolk and everyone knows if you're in Norfolk it takes ages to get anywhere so if you're going to do some CPD and you're asking teachers from different schools to go to one point um, why not just do it online use yeah, um, our platform Alan Partridge it. could be your host be amazing. <laughs> um, yeah I mean there's a few other companies so I'm an advisor to an organisation in Nor- um, Northern Ireland called make a they're doing short form uh, CPD they previously did the GCSE bite size content and there's another one called um, Spongy Elephant that I saw uh, entered the BET Awards but yeah I think they're trying to boil CPD down into sort of bite sized chunks rather than kind of uh, sort of longer form and wouldn't it be stuff that's top bet, down as well. Wouldn't it be good if BET <coughs> actually was a, a platform rather than just selling and just you know um, doing some of the things that they're doing at the moment wouldn't it be great if you could actually as an audience be able to go and hear some of the solutions that we know of mm. you know that it's only through perhaps uh, conversations at events like this or through UK and chat or, or other means that sometimes we find out about things um, I, I mean BET I think really needs to look at how it can do things differently I know it's got the lead meet as well but it would be great if we could almost kind of join up and, and see how we could do things share best practice yeah. um, and on uh, Wednesday Hannah and I were chatting and we will be launching Women Ed and, and Century will be hosting this um, but we will be launching a series of CPD content for all teachers free in the nation um, on digital leadership and that should be with the timing that we've got for our schedule out of about mid-February. We're also hosting free CPD on safeguarding, on neuroscience, on growth mindset, all on Century Mm. Um, just because we don't think this is something that you should pay for. Um, we just think that at the end of the day, you know, we're paying for people to do miles and miles of sort of going and travelling and doing sort of face-to-face. Face-to-face is obviously, it can be really, really helpful to go face-to-face, but often that's sitting in a room exactly like this with somebody stood at the front and doing the whole kind of one-size-fits-all lecture, whereas actually you could do that online and it would be far more helpful for females, for women who've got family at home, to be able to do that online. So that will all be launching from January, but the Digital Leadership Series and in association with Women Ed should be out by about mid Feb, and it's going to be great. It's like really like kind of new media, get everyone involved. And it's just really, really like basic things. And what Kirsty was saying was quite right. It's about the tried and tested model. What you want to do is hear from somebody who's Love used it. something, who says, this is fantastic. Um, David Green, one of the uh, deputy heads at Shireland, um, wrote a piece in Special Children magazine about Century that I wasn't even aware of until Special Children sent it to me. And it was called Tried and Tested. And so many schools came to Century after that and said, 
we want this because he says it works at Charlotte Collegiate Academy. And that's the kind of networking community that we should be, you, you should be creating. Mm. Um, and women ed can absolutely sort of help shape that, you know? And this is about Innovate My School. So we were at an Innovate My School um, event on Wednesday at my place and they're launching a platform <laughs> where you can triangulate the feedback on products. I just think the market is swamped. There are so many apps, hardware, softwares. It, like, it's the wood for the trees, isn't it? And quite often it comes down to price. So basically they're going to launch this platform where you get feedback from the, the school business manager on the value for money and the teacher or the leader on the impact. And I said, you then need to hear from the children or the parents about the impact on their learning. If we could triangulate and rag ray all these different products where you've then got credibility, it would help guide us we want to invest in as opposed to literally plucking wood for the trees or whoever rang me last week and buying that piece and that's also going to be that solution driven isn't solution it driven. so you're going to if you've got a problem in your school you can put that into the, the database, database and it'll just bring up all the reviews and relevant can I, can I just say I think because we've also got on to sort of like try and test those kind of procurement type things I think the, I think the point that we, we're all really really keen to emphasise is that no matter what you find and how you find it it's mm -hmm. about you and what we want is that you, on Monday morning, go back to school and you look for the solutions, you find the product, and as a female leader, you bring it into the school. Um, and I think that that's really, really important. So what we want to do mm. is we want to have women in the school, we want to have women in leadership, in middle management, wherever they are, taking this technology and showing others about what they can do. You don't have to train them on it, but if you take a leadership role with this, it's so, you, you act as such a fantastic role model to all the teachers around you, as well as all the young girls who can see the fact that you're the one you know, raising these issues in, in your particular institution. Well, if yeah, you can't so find if I, a, um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just very quickly to say, if you can't find a solution, um, go and find somebody like Priya and say, I want this, because that's been the great thing that we've done working with We've built so much stuff is, for Shiloh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that we've said, well, we want it to do this, and that's what a good piece of technology should be about. Mm -hmm. It's that we should be together to be able to shape that. And I know working with Tute as well, yeah. um, and the work that Ellie did online, we were able to feed back on that platform, and you were able to shape, rather than it being somebody's idea, this is what you want, and you will use it like this. That's not going to work for all our, our different schools. We want te technology, should be malleable, it should be flexible, it should be agile <coughs> for us to be able to fit around our own context. I think that's quite a great indicator of if it's a good piece of technology, yes. if you, if you yeah. can co-create it together, um, and alarm bells might go off if, if that's not an option. Um, I, um, I do I'm actually under. want to say something yeah. um, just to loop this conversation. It's very fascinating for Microsoft to be listening to these conversations uh, for starters. Um, but I actually just want to loop it back to why we're here on a Saturday morning. So um, the fourth industrial revolution is happening now. <laughs> and more importantly, what the technology sector across Europe has seen, um, we've got a shortage of skills. Right. This sector has grown three times the rate of employment, which means that currently Microsoft are receiving CVs that these people aren't qualified for the jobs that we have in our building today. Right? It's that black and white. And um, when we did a research, when we did some research, we asked 70% um, of British schoolgirls feel that they don't have the confidence to go into STEM related subjects and they gave two reasons for this. Number one, it was very clear to them that men and women aren't paid the same, right? And alongside that, the roles that they wanted to go into, whether it's being an engineer or a scientist, they saw that it was dominated by men. And number two, and this is my plea to you, they didn't have those inspirational female role models at their school. And so as a result of it, they just felt that it wasn't for them. So for me, everything here that has been spoken of is brilliant. And if you can find something that m works for your school, whether it's Microsoft, whether it's Google, whether, who, whatever, we don't care. What we want is that by 2020, the European Commission have clearly stated that there's going to be pretty much 900,000 jobs out there that we're just not going to be able to fill. 
And so for us, it's super important that we do whatever we can as a company to help those kids with those digital skills they need in order to succeed today, mm. not tomorrow. How about then that if we had six months, we're now in October, how many months is that? Well, it's more than six months. If we empowered the staff to be digital leaders between now and October, October is International Day of the Girl, we could host a virtual conference for the girls in our schools on that day, <laughs> but we're actually contributing to it and leading to it, and that passing the baton on to the next generation, Microsoft could drive that with us, because yeah. it is about, it's, it, it, Women Ed is about us, but actually we're affecting change for us, but we need to really affect change for the next generation. Yeah, 100%. Definitely. So um, I'm going to, I know the uh, International Women's Day theme was push for change, I think. Press for change. Press for change. Press can, progress. can I press for five extra minutes? Because we started five minutes later, so <laughs> <laughs> that'd be fantastic. Um, yeah, uh, um, so I think really importantly, we may have blown some of these already, but takeaways from everyone. So my takeaway list is go and check out, someone recommended to me the other day to go and check out uh, Ada's list. So it's a list of uh, digital female leaders, really, really useful. Um, from the first day of Christmas, I'm totally ripping off the 12 days of Christmas with a series on, which I'll release on Twitter, which is called uh, the 12 Days of Digital Leadership. And it's looking back across 100 episodes <coughs> of the EdTech podcast and who said what and consolidating some themes. So um, Girl Geek, again, it's really, really useful for um, resources online. And there's a, a, a movement which started out of Austin, so South by Southwest EDU, called... Um, uh, EdTech Women and they've Creative Commons all of their assets and basically what they're doing is trying to you know support women entrepreneurs in education innovation um, and then they so there's chapters all over the world so well, I'm going to bring that to the UK and London and there'll be meetups and we would love to work with you and we, I think we're going to collaborate with, with Women Ed and the idea being that we can you know um, help bring some of these lessons back and forth and create that um, exchange so any final takeaways before we go to questions for five minutes? Um, we've, uh, we've got some funding through OCR um, and um, over the last three years it, 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 there was a fund that was about seconding a teacher and they realised it was a West Midlands fund, it didn't actually serve any purpose for OCR. Um, but So what they did is they, they seeded innovation um, here in a couple of schools. Um, and so that on the OCR website there are 18 projects, most of them um, technology related but they're supposed to be like toolkits and Danny you, you did one of the, the toolkits for, for them but they're about um, seeding teacher innovation using technology um, and then creating a little toolkit and then making it available and they're all free on the OCR website you have to dig around a bit but I think if you google OCR and Shyland toolkits you might just get there if you're lucky but they're, they're there and, and um, a really easy kind of almost like how to guides basically uh, any questions from the yeah. audience? Yeah. Okay. So um, I've got a question, and I, I get the poverty of kind of knowledge and, and, and expertise, but there's actually a, a, a real issue around the divide around poverty and folk who, who on our doorsteps don't actually have the kind of access that, that we expect at the, in this day and age. And that's certainly the case in some of our schools, mm. um, combined with the fact that there are folk who don't know, know how to improve access for those who do. So what? What can we do as a group and what can industry partners do around um, the divide? Because I think in the fourth industrial revolution, a small but significant tier of, of certainly young people and their families are completely left behind in a way that is beyond what most of us know and quite often we're blind to, especially if it's one or two individuals in a school, but you know, in some cases it's quite large numbers in cohorts of children who don't, who don't have, and the assumption that they do creates all sorts of tensions so, so what, what, they, do we, what do we yeah. do to, to unlock? Well, so what, what, we need, great what we need to do is, so DFE have brought a group together. I was there with Sir Mark actually um, just this week, and um, I, I think actually we're the only two people who mentioned it, which is a bit sad. But we said, look, what you've got to ensure you do is that when you are talking about technology, promoting technology, you're not increasing or you're not decreasing social mobility. Because what's the danger of technology is that certain people will get their hands on it, and it's amazing. And you know we've got an AI platform that does all sorts of stuff, and actually there are children who get left at the bottom. We've got a couple of colleges where students do struggle, and actually the problem there is infrastructure. They do have the devices, they may have old devices, they have a browser. The problem is they actually can't get online because there's not enough bandwidth, and it's often that. So Department of Education have promised, absolutely promised, um, that they will sort out. Inf and I think it's way too late considering that every school in Uruguay has fibre. Um, 
and we can't even manage, you know, um, sort of normal bandwidth levels. But they have said this is something that they're working on with Department of Culture, Media and Sport. That's the first thing, because we're talking about technology today, so that's the major problem. If you don't have the infrastructure, how is everyone actually going to get online and use this technology? But the way in which groups I've seen work really positively, so in Norfolk, so there's a couple of colleges there, like, um, I mean, CWA College of West Anglia when I was there, it's a ghost town, right? I know why Brexit happened, because I went there and I thought, London's living in a bubble, right? And um, but the things that they've done there, which is really, really interesting, is that they have buddied up with other institutions, other colleges, other schools in the area to try and at least learn best practice. And then they've got an ICT suite, and what they've been doing is hiring that suite out and using technology on a sort of once-a-week basis. You don't have to be a one-to-one technology, one-to-one iPad school um, to be utilising the best of technology. Um, you can actually be thinking about other ways, and we've seen this work. It is really challenging, it is difficult, but I think it's a mindset issue as well, in the sense that we, our leaders mustn't think that because there's little technology and little bandwidth they can't do anything you've got to find a way you've got to use your limited resources and then what you can do is i think i think it's the power of lobby as well but get together with other schools and colleges figure out how you've got a way forward in your particular region unfortunately without fixing infrastructure we are going to be leaving lots of students behind and that is a shame because obviously they're the ones where it's like a sausage machine right you well, post we, need, we, need to, we need to not accept that and we need to be no. really mindful of it but we need to be really careful in our narrative that we don't make those children but how does, how does every how does, to not but make how does every revolution right? happen though and this is one thing that i said to dfe how does every revolution happen it doesn't happen because westminster decides that something needs to change it happens because consumers demand something new Right. Well, add to that, because yeah. for me, yeah. go back and look at your PP spend in your school. No, exactly. Because the people yeah. premium it's budget, totally a lot of our schools are paying for extra members of staff. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, yeah, that squares it off, they're getting one-to-one -one support. Ours is buying all of our, te all of our students' devices. Mm -hmm. So we've got a payment plan so that every child gets a device, and either the parents can pay the monthly loan fee for three years and they all get a laptop, or the PP spend can do that. So for me, it's about challenging how the money's being spent <laughs> in the schools. And then if you can't challenge upwards and get that happening in your school, go and do the rocket fund. You could go and do a rocket fund for, we need 20 devices for our 20% of our school who are, P, who are PP and haven't got a device at home. You're going to get big sponsors and corporates doing gift aid, giving money to the school. So I think it's about using those two, those two funding streams initially yeah. in the right way. And also... When you find the benefits of technology and what solution that particular technology is going to provide for your institution, even if it's limited, if you've got limited hardware, it's going to save you money if you found the right technology. So what I find really, really interesting is when I go into schools and the first thing we always get told is we have no money, they always actually find it. And actually our product, interestingly enough, is subsidised by large corporates. So IBM, so all of those companies that use our tech subsidise the school sector. So it's, it's actually pretty cheap for what it is. But what's really interesting is when they find out that they don't need as many supply mm. teachers, when they find out that actually they need less TAs but they can allocate them efficiently because actually they know where intervention is necessary because they're using the right tech, they do find that piece of money. And so, and, and, we've gone, and we've got some of the poorest schools in the country. We've got schools where they've lost half a million pounds worth of funding like that in one year. And actually because they're outstanding, mm. potentially, right? they've got no progress. They've got no sort of progress to, to demonstrate. So, but, but the point is fundamental, and actually, it, it, it's a slightly different point that you were making, and I, and I think that everyone should take that on board. It's the fact that some people don't actually have the access, and we have this sort of line, this sort of poverty line in the country, um, where we can't forget those particular but students. I don't think, that actually, I don't think necessarily that this digital divide, I think it goes across social stratas, and I think um, what, what I, I see from the schools that I've worked with, both primary and secondary, that it's more the attitude of, of senior leadership team towards the technology in the school that causes the, the, this divide. So I've been in very affluent areas, so you know, the, the act, we all assume that this digital divide means that poorer students aren't getting the access at school and that's absolutely not right because I've been into schools where they're from very affluent areas and because the head teacher doesn't necessarily see the, see the, the value of technology they don't invest in, in the technology and therefore they're not using it and kind of almost going back to the CPD question you know, there's this horrible, horrible cycle of, of teachers coming into the profession and not being adequately trained at initial teacher training level 
in terms of how to harness technology for learning and therefore go into the system, don't really value it, go up through the echelons of, of leadership and get to be ahead and then don't, and I've seen, a bit, I've been you know, teaching for nearly 25 years now so I've seen this, this happen and that makes me ever so sad. So the digital divide for me actually goes across social strata and can be um, from, you know, we've got schools here in this area that use technology really well and some that don't, but equally I've been into some really nice places, uh, you know, out in the countryside that have equally um, interesting and challenges there. And it is a, uh, a lottery for those, for pupils. I think it's a really valid point. To school. I think it's a really interesting point. And the, uh, look up the Shift Commission, they've just done a report on uh, scenarios of future work, and one of them is the King of the Castle one where very few there's fewer jobs and those jobs are consolidated with the tech giants and it's those people have the skills the other one is task-based economy so there's challenge challenges with each but the other thing i've seen is um community use of libraries which you know we need to uh, support but you know as maker spaces and digital spaces um thank you that's a, a yeah. great positive point to end on and i think you know in terms of implementing some of that let's go and chat over lunch if you've got extra questions i'm very very sorry we ran out of time but please do come and find us and ask them or tweet them out can um, i just say a big thank you to sophie for chairing this because yeah. having oh i'm just looking down this line there's some very there's some of us are very very challenging in terms of speaking so being yeah. to <laughs> challenging much better than a quiet panel and, and if you haven't already subscribed to the edtech podcast that, that Sophie produces, please do. It's through the iTunes. There's some great stuff on there. You yeah, and there. bring your ideas and bring what things you need to change, and let's see what we can do together. But thank you very much. That's all from this week's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you're listening in. You can also join us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram and we love to hear your feedback. If there are questions you'd like asked in every episode, do let me know. And if you're interested in sponsoring, ping me a note at the edtechpodcast at gmail.com. Have a wonderful week and see you next time. Bye bye.